It's my turn, although it's really Jim's turn. Please stand as we pray. Today is the annual day of prayer for tra victims of trafficking. And so in our prayer today, we want to remember them. Living God, you freed the people of Israel from cruel slavery in Egypt and led them to a promised land flowing with milk and honey. We ask you to liberate today all the children, women, and men who are enslaved by the cruel yoke of human trafficking in our nation and around the world. We seek your divine protection for all who are exploited and enslaved, for those forced into labor, trafficked into sexual slavery, and denied freedom. We beseech you to release them from their chains. Grant them protection, safety, and empowerment Restore their dignity and provide them a new beginning. Show us how we might end exploitation by addressing its causes. Help us reach out in support of victims and survivors of human trafficking. Make us instruments of your spirit for their liberation. For this we pray through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
be seated. Some very significant things tell us that we're in paganism up to our necks. The legalization of pederasty in California, the coordinated efforts to validate pedophilia, or I mean minor attraction, and the ongoing scourge of abortion is a measurement of how deep in it we actually are. Part of the evils of paganism is that it perpetrates bad stuff upon children. All pagan cultures abuse children. All of them do. This latest stuff about pederasty and pedophilia is alarming, but to me it is not surprising because they are intrinsically tied to abortion. If you allow innocent babies to be murdered, you will eventually allow them to be abused if they get a chance to be born. Abortion is the poisonous tree, and pedophilia is one of the poisonous fruits. In Leviticus 18.21, God told the Israelites not to sacrifice their children to the Canaanite pagan god Moloch. The verse reads, Neither shall you give any of your offspring to offer them to Moloch, neither shall you profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Moloch was an ancient god who required child sacrifice as worship. Idols of Moloch were giant metal statues of a man with a bull's head. The idol had a hole in the abdomen, and its arms were outstretched to take in the child. A fire was lit inside of the abdomen. And I'm going to let you imagine the rest of this stuff for yourself. But after the child was placed into Moloch's arms, the drums would beat so loudly that the mother could not hear her child scream and thus be made to feel bad about what she was doing. Americans are modern Moloch worshipers. The drums of the media beat loudly so that we don't feel bad about what we're doing. In 2015, David Daleiden released four videos of abortionists which revealed really just one difference between Moloch's worshipers and us. It's the way in which we kill babies. They burn them, we dismember them. Incidentally, in 2019, David Daleiden faced 15 felony counts in court for secretly recording these abortionists' conversation. This boomeranged on Planned Parenthood because those incriminating videos were brought back up and shown again in court, and the videos made their rounds again on the internet, causing outrage for a second time. For this, we should praise God. It is illegal to do to an unborn human baby what you would never dream of doing to an unborn puppy or kitten. Heaven forbid you try to abort an unborn dolphin. In fact, cruelty to any one of these animals will bring the wrath of our culture down upon you, and no doubt, the law too. But be cruel to an unborn human baby? Ah, that's okay. The prevailing debate over abortion used to be, when does life begin? One doctor actually said, life does not begin until the parents bring the baby home from the hospital. When life begins, is the wrong question. If you look at them under the microscope, you will see that embryos are full of life. The science is so definitive on this that past and present Planned Parenthood presidents will not discuss when life begins anymore. Is it alive is the wrong question. The right question is, is it human? Well, let's just think about this for a minute. Human male reproductive matter joins with human female reproductive matter. Is it a puppy? Is it a kitty? Is it a dolphin? No, sir. It's human. And because it is human, it should be respected as sacred. 
The Wesleyan Church's position on abortion echoes this. We believe abortion is the taking of a human life. Therefore, society brings grave danger to itself by permitting abortion on demand and thus treating God-given life so lightly. We call our members to oppose this social evil with great vigor. We instruct our people to avoid this sin personally and call them to the work of enlightening a blind culture as we once did with the sin of slavery. The videos that I just referenced show Planned Parenthood's medical directors dickering about the price of fetal specimens. I'd also like to mention that two of them were gorging on food and wine while talking about selling infant bits and pieces. I refuse to call these women doctors because doctors are supposed to first do no harm. Much of the conversation seen on these videos centered around how much money buyers should have to pay for baby parts. One abortionist joked that she hopes to sell enough baby parts to buy a Lamborghini. Lamborghinis run a quarter to a half a million dollars. For what they're selling baby organs for, she might be able to get one. Livers go for $750, and liver thymus pairs go for $1,600. Abortion clinics can make at least $100,000 a year just on the sale of stem cells. It is against God's law to make a profit off of selling baby parts. In Deuteronomy 27:25, we read, Cursed is anyone who accepts payment to kill an innocent person. And if you don't give two hoots and a popcorn ball about God's laws, federal law also prohibits the commercial sale of baby parts. The sale or purchase of human baby tissues is a felony punishable by up to 10 years in prison or a fine of up to a half a million dollars. 42 United States C 289G-2, if you want to look it up. Whether or not it is legal is missing the point entirely. The point is, it's baby parts. And guess what? All of us taxpayers are helping to pay for this to the tune of up to $540 million annually. Dirty deeds, as it turns out, are not done dirt cheap. Planned Parenthood staunchly defends its role in selling baby parts. They say that baby parts are good for research. They say baby parts can help find treatments for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. How can we, in good conscience, find cures for those of us who have had a chance to live at the expense of those who haven't? Personally, I would rather die than sacrifice an innocent, unborn baby to save my sorry hide. How in the world did we come to this? How did this happen? The exact same way as Moloch worshipers got where they were. They were godless, and two, they practiced unrestrained sexual immorality. Unrestrained sexual activity produces thousands and thousands of unwanted babies. See your sex ed manual for further details. Planned Parenthood's answer to the problem of unwanted babies is this, and I quote, abortion is a treatment of unwanted pregnancy. The most deadly place for a child today is in her mother's womb, and I say her on purpose. Since Roe versus Wade in 1973, there have been over 58 million babies sacrificed to the American Moloch. Of the million abortions a year, only 2% of those are due to incest, rape, or health risks to the mother. 98% of them are done for reasons that most of us find morally objectionable. Like, for instance, I'm pregnant with a girl and I'd rather have a boy. Abortion is stained with racism. Margaret Sanger started this little thing called the Negro Project. While this sounds like a nice little program meant to help black people, it wasn't. It was a genocidal eugenics program which focused on getting rid of those considered to be inferior or unfit. Margaret Sanger planned to eliminate blacks vis-a-vis -vis sterilization, but if a black lady got pregnant despite of all of Marge's efforts to prevent it, an abortion 
could be a backup plan. The goals of Sanger's Negro Project are being met today. Nearly 40% of all black pregnancies end in abortion. Black women access abortion clinics at five times the rate of white women. Abortion in the black community is a plague. It is said if you are black and you are born in New York, it's a miracle because more blacks are aborted in New York than are born. This is Margaret Sanger's sinister plan in action. Planned Parenthood showed its true colors when it honed in on inner city minority neighbors, neighborhoods in the 1980s. Of the more than 100 school-based clinics that opened nationwide, none have been opened at a primarily all-white school. None have been opened in a suburban middle-class school. All of them, all of them have been opened at black minority or ethnic schools. Looking for real systematic racism? There it is. We just found it. When an organization was begun by a rabid racist, when it has a racist history, when its goals are racist, when its programs focus on race, it really doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out it's racist. How can anyone believe anything else about Planned Parenthood except that it is a rat's nest of racist bigotry and prejudice? Oh, I know, I know. Lately, Planned Parenthood is trying to distance themselves from Marge Sanger. It doesn't look very good to be associated with such a blatant racist, especially in today's climate. Even though they are busy shunning Sanger, they still are practicing her racist ideologies, thus having their cake and eating it too. Now, I love me some Kanye West. I see those eyeballs rolling, leave me alone. I don't like a lot of his music, but I like a lot of his viewpoints. What I like the most about Kanye is he never backs down to bullies, not ever. He's not silenced by a bully. So I was watching a recent podcast that featured Kanye, and Kanye got into talking about the horrors of Planned Parenthood, and the interv an interviewer quickly jumped to their defense, saying that they might have been a racist organization in the past, but they're certainly not anymore. It's not fair to keep tying them to Marge, the interviewer insisted, because everything they do now is good. Well, here's something the interviewer probably didn't know that I know, because I research stuff. Kanye and his wife once considered aborting one of their daughters, their daughter North. So this issue of abortion is, per is personal to him and his wife. So Kanye wasn't one to sit down and shut up, and he came right back at the interviewer, and he said, Margaret Sanger, the founder, was an avowed racist whose goal was to reduce the black population in America, and she succeeded. 80% of abortion clinics in America are in minority neighborhoods. Over 22 and a half million black babies have been aborted in 47 years. 1,000 black babies are aborted every day. Abortion is the number one killer of black lives in the United States. According to the CDC, abortion kills more black people than HIV, homicide, diabetes, accidents, cancer, and heart disease combined. Kanye's point was Planned Parenthood is the fruit of the poisonous tree, meaning if the source of the the source is tainted, the tree, then everything that comes from it is tainted as well. Margaret Sanger is the tree, and the tree is poison. Planned Parenthood is the fruit. The fruit is poison, and you cannot unpoison the fruit. Mainstream media, celebrities, healthcare professionals, and politicians continue to promote Planned Parenthood, while Christians scratch their collective behinds. But the reemergence of Delighton's videos made the truth stand up and scream out loud. There's a lot more videos like it out there, all of which will turn your stomachs. All of these videos tell the exact same story. We are killing babies, ripping them apart, 
limb from limb. And then, if that's not bad enough, we sell them for their parts. Even if you are pro-abortion, this should enrage you. I do think hope is in the air. Sadly, this hope won't come from my generation. It was our generation that fought tooth and nail to get abortion on demand in the first place. I don't see our generation backing down for love nor money. To admit that they were wrong at this point would bring down a burden of guilt so hard that it would kill them. Any hope we have is going to come from those who are younger. Compared to 40 to 60 year olds, young adults are much less likely to support abortion. Planned Parenthood claims that America's youth are primarily pro-abortion. This is statistically untrue. Most of them are, in fact, anti-abortion. This is borne out in the drop of abortions done in the last few years. The old people who push for abortions aren't having babies anymore, so they're not having abortions. Young people are having babies, and in general, they are against abortion, so less abortions are being done. The majority of people who walk in pro-life marches in our country are 25 years old and younger. With each passing year, the percentage of young people who support abortion drops. Clearly, more young people are against abortion than our older people. And that's just a fact, Jack. So when you hear old people trying to assign blame for abortion, tell them to go look in the mirror. The reason young Americans have slowly but surely become anti-abortion is because they grew up seeing videos like Dave and Delion's. They grew up seeing gruesome, gruesome images of abortion on the internet. As the younger generations see these images, they don't see abortion as an act of reproductive freedom but as an act of violence against an innocent victim. All young adults have to do is look in the mirror to see someone who could have legally been aborted. In a sense, every American born after 1973 is a survivor of Roe versus Wade. Our grandbaby is. Her mother sat in an abortion clinic and she was going to have Olivia aborted. But some song started playing on the radio, and I don't even remember the name of it, but it caught her attention. And at the last minute, she left the clinic, thus saving Olivia from the abortionist's knife. It's personal. Abortion is personal. A passage from Proverbs 24, 11 and 12 reads, Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stagger to their death. Don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts, and he sees you. He who guards your soul knows you knew. None of us are ignorant of what's going on. Not one of us can say, well, I didn't know, especially since we have the ability to see what is happening on the Internet. An article written by a staunch abortion supporter, posed this question. If you think abortion is so wrong that it's murder, what do you think should be done with women who've had abortions? The author says it's a trick question that he likes to ask every time he runs into a pro-lifer. Because if he asks a pro-lifer this question, they'll shut up immediately because none of us are going to suggest that the woman goes to prison or get the death penalty. So this got me to thinking, what is the answer to this question? What do those of us who stand firmly against abortion think should happen to a woman who's had an abortion? Well, nothing can be done for the baby anymore. That's done and over. The baby is in God's hands. But the woman is still living, and because she is still living, we must do everything we possibly can for her. She should be forgiven if that's what she wants. Not only should she be forgiven, but she must be told she is forgiven. She must be told that Jesus can fix all those broken places in her life and transform her. She must be offered the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ through the church. 
So that's what I think should, what should happen to a woman who's had an abortion. I think she should be forgiven. I think she should be helped. It's been a long time since Roe v. Wade legalized abortion, and that means there's been plenty of time for a lot of women to have abortions. One out of three women have done so. This means post-abortive women are everywhere. Whether or not you know it, you know a woman who's had an abortion. I know several, and I promise you, you do too. In fact, I guarantee it. A woman who had an abortion once said, the church must grow a spine and speak up about it. If we don't, she said, abortive women will think they've committed the unforgivable sin and that they are going directly to hell. We must bring the love of Jesus Christ into this dark, violent world. We must shine Christ's light on this dark world. Too many born and unborn lives are depending on it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we remember the victims of trafficking, we remember the victims of abortion. And they're being trafficked in a different way. Their parts are being sold. Lord, we pray an end to this gruesome and evil practice in our world. I pray also, Lord, for women who've had an abortion and are struggling and suffering, trying to make sense out of life. Help us to reach them, Lord. Help us to love them in a way that you'd have them loved. Amen.